Welcome to Friday's edition of Anglican Unscripted. This episode is going to be as casual as we can be. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today, September 22nd, 2017. Two, one. Okay, as people know, the last four weeks there's been hurricanes all over the south, Texas, hit, uh, rains in Louisiana, Florida, we uh, lost many uh, Caribbean islands, Puerto Rico got hit three days ago, two days ago, just devastating winds, uh, knocked out all the electricity on the island. Um, George, give us an update, how is uh, northwest uh, Florida uh, recovering? We're back. We're back to power, back to phone service. We're doing pretty well. That's good. We uh, we had a diocesan board meeting yesterday uh, to give you extent of the difficulties that is going to be fa- we're going to be facing. Uh, the Orange County, which is Orlando school district, is re- expecting eighty four thousand children from Puerto Rico to enroll in schools you know in the Orlando area this fall. They're expecting a massive migration out of Puerto Rico which is still without power across the entire island and without water. Many, many, many schools are damaged, and there's a large Puerto Rican population in the Orlando metropolitan area. So we're going to see a lot of migrants, uh, economic and disaster migrants, to to Florida, to Connecticut, mm-hmm. to New Jersey, to sure. New York, yeah. where there are large Puerto Rican populations. And this is going to be, oh, it's going to be, oh, it's going to be busy time for us over the next... Well, this is what we saw with Katrina. At Katrina, we saw 500,000, 600,000 people leave Louisiana, actually move to Houston and other parts of uh, Texas and Alabama, and um, they just migrated because there was just nothing left to go back to uh, in parts of Louisiana. It's going to be interesting how this sets long-term for Puerto Rico. Beautiful island, um, obviously bankrupt before this, completely bankrupt now. Um, the long-term... Uh, prognosis for Puerto Rico, what would it be? Very poor. Mm -hmm. Uh, Puerto Rico used to have an economic base. In fact, didn't Jill uh, commute to Puerto Rico? Yeah, when when she worked for General Electric early in our careers, she would spend uh, two weeks in Puerto Rico and three weeks at home. That was fun, you know, uh, as a young couple starting a family. But uh, Puerto Rico, as she will tell you, you know, the coast was where the wealth was, and the inner cities was, you know, third world country. And those economic incentives to build factories in Puerto Rico have all been phased out. Mm-hmm. And Puerto Rico is now a tourist-driven economy. And the tourist sites have been devastated. And it'll take months. Um, in Florida, we had, we had ambulances and we had uh, utility trucks from as far north as Maine mm-hmm. come down and we are able to rebuild our infrastructure almost immediately. It's going to take months in the keys. Puerto Rico, they have to ship everything in. There's nothing there to start with, and it's going to take years to come back up. Yeah, that's the biggest point. Day one, uh, you know, 12, 18 hours after the hurricane struck, the winds are dying down. All these power trucks were just pouring into the state like they did uh, Houston, and, you know, they got the power back on. Uh, saving people who have dialysis, people who have refrigerated drugs, people uh, who need more advanced living conditions um, from having to migrate out. Here in Puerto Rico, uh, people with advanced stage kidney disease and other stuff um, have to leave or uh, face uh, death. Also, uh, you mentioned the point about government. Um, Katrina, we saw the breakdown of government in New Orleans. Not so much in the rest of Louisiana, but in New Orleans, the social civil services just evaporated. The police, there were news reports of uh, New Orleans Police Department cars found in Ohio and mm-hmm. stuff where they, the officers had just skedaddled. Um, we've not had massive looting in Houston. We've had isolated incidents of looting in Miami and Fort Lauderdale, but the, the police and the emergency and fire services uh, and the National Guard has maintained law and order, and we're very, very quickly coming back. Puerto Rico has a dysfunctional government, dysfunctional police force, no emergency services 
really of any caliber. And so the things that we in the mainland take for granted, um, they don't even have. And so th that is why if you want your child to have an education this year, you're moving them to Florida or to Connecticut or to New Jersey. Yeah. You're not staying in Puerto Rico. No, you're not. Um, let's move on with the news. Um, first, we're trying to say this every week. Uh, if you want to really help us, y donate Anglican Inc. forward slash donate so I can uh, pay George his, his incredible salary. Um, also, like us on Facebook. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, have, where have you been mailing the checks? You <laughs> haven't been getting the checks. Oh, <laughs> oh no. What's that with that one? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh geez. Uh, I, I, I'll just send you the 1099 with the zero on it. Um, but okay. please help donate. Uh, we obviously travel. Uh, George and I, early on, we had planned to go to the uh, the primate speeding. I remember George said, oh, I really want to go. We should go. Why don't we just rent a, a, a little Airbnb and uh, on the outskirts of town, and uh, it'll be a lot of fun. And I was like, George, I, I went last time, and I got uh, a 40-minute press conference is the only video I obtained, plus an interview with Archbishop Foley, which is good. Um, it just isn't worth it if GAFCON and Global South and Archbishop Foley don't go. He goes, you're right. But it would be fun. Yeah, it would be fun. We didn't go, but uh, for future events, we need you guys to donate for travel and expenses, please. So if you go to anglican.inc forward slash donate, that would be more than helpful. Yes, George, I thought you were going to say something. Well, I, I think we, we should jump into this uh, uh -oh. primates meeting because why are we not going? Is it just poverty? Not really. No. Well, yes, we'll always say that. <laughs> yes. That's it. What? <laughs> well, hold on. I, I just checked. We have $400 in our account. It's not a lot of poverty. But go on. Did I tell you I need... No. Yes. <laughs> we have... 39 primates, if you exclude Foley Beach and uh, Johnson Tamu of York. Mm -hmm. 39 primates. Of those 39, 16, this will be their first primates meeting. Up to six of the people who came last time won't be coming this time, who are eligible to come. Uh, two of them have made public stand statements, Stanley and Tagali and Nicholas Oko. Foley Beach has not been invited this time. And Basically, what's happened is just about all of our sources are not going to be there. So uh, Munir and Nice and the GAFCON and the Global South primates, completely new fellows. We need to rebuild relationships because um, this, well, because and because of the new boys here. There's nothing that's going to happen at this meeting. No. There's it, no follow through, no momentum. It's basically a meet and greet time. And as Archbishop Welby, I don't know how the man can stand not being embarrassed by his. Well, I'm not going to laugh. He just at is the camera. so excited. He's excited. I mean, my God, you know, where do they dig up these speechwriters? I, I thought Soviet life went out of business a long time ago, but. The next thing I'm expecting is a picture of Justin Welby with some happy peasants at a tractor farm uh, strumming well, their ballot. I thought, I, thought I was reading the, the, the quote, and I'm waiting for him to do the, the Trump thing, where he states a, a pretty good fact, and then he tells you what he's going to do, and then he says, believe me. I was waiting for Welby to do the, I'm excited, believe me. <laughs> Just, oh, please help us. But yet, yeah, well, well, excited. He is excited yeah. because this is this is going to be this is not going to be the last meeting. No, there is well, no anticipation from anybody who I've spoken to who is going that this is going to amount to much. Well, you and I. I went, hope I'm surprised. Yeah, you and I went to Tanzania. Nobody was excited to be there. Uh, Rowan wasn't excited. Uh, none of the primates I spot, uh, got to speak with were excited to be there uh, because they had hard issues to talk about. In fairness, the last meeting was the hard issue. Uh, meeting, gathering, was the hard issue talk. It means if he's excited, they have nothing to talk about. They're going to just talk about you know the the mosquito nets for Africa and the uh, um, uh, ongoing Indaba process, the weed whacker who's just outside my door. Uh, those are the exciting things Justin Welby and, and the primates will be talking about, George. Gavin Ashenden has a has made a very good point on this show that the closer the religious leaders get to politics the farther they get from God 
and that when we have these primates meetings that wind up talking about global warming, where mosquito nets is our favorite one. And don't focus on what it is unique about the Christian life or what differentiates this from a United Nations uh, powwow. Then there's no, uh, then, then it's meaningless. I I'll give you an example. Did anybody realize that 125 Episcopal bishops this week had published an open letter in the New York Times opposing the uh, revocation of the Dreamer Act, the DACA? The, the, Act New, the New York Western what? Trump. The New York what? Exactly. These bishops published an open letter in, in other words, nobody. Nobody who is not already on board with their way of thinking is going to notice this or even know it existed. They spent tens of thousands of dollars to do this. And it is a total waste of time. Well, they it will influence e nobody. Irrelevant people wearing purple put a publication together for a publication that is completely irrelevant uh, and used to be the paper of record. And for, and for people like me, I can say, you know, these people can clearly discern God speaking to them about United States immigration policy, but they cannot clearly discern what God is saying about sexuality, abortion, mm -hmm. divorce, you know, all yeah. the things that someone would actually listen to a bishop about, they don't talk about. No. They just want to have unity and these ridiculous political statements that are of no consequence. You and I have had the, the joy and delight uh, to watch liberal, uh, progressive thought, uh, broken seminaries put their people into churches and see the results of that with the Episcopal Church over the last uh, 15, 20 years. Um, I remember in 1983 when I uh, kneeled before a bishop in Alabama to be brought into the uh, Episcopal Church, it was... Oh, we got two million people on an average morning on a Sunday. This is a great church. You'll love it. Um, we're dealing with some minor issues with sexuality, but we'll overcome that in the long run. This church has nothing but um, growth in the future. And Kevin, we're starting the decade of evangelism. This church is going places. And I'm like, ah, cool. I'll be an Episcopalian. And George, um, we've now watched the progressiveness take hold. We've, you know, obviously enjoyed the, the decade of Catherine Jeffords Shorey, now Michael Curry. And every year, uh, the, uh, the Episcopal Church faithfully publishes their numbers. And I think they're pretty accurate and honest about it uh, more and more recently. Um, here in Connecticut, where I live, uh, the Episcopal Church lost another 6%. Um, and I'm not surprised. I drive by these churches all the time. They don't have any money anymore to keep up the churches. Um, even in uh, popular towns, uh, there's just they don't even show up in the newspaper anymore. The Episcopal Church is dying despite their best efforts. Yes and no. No, that's yes, yes Kevin. You're absolutely right. Just say you're it. You're absolutely it right. <laughs> you're absolutely right, Kevin. The <laughs> National Church declined, I believe, 1.9% in average Sunday attendance. Mm -hmm. And that's the number you look at. Don't look at membership. That means nothing. Uh, Central Florida had a big drop in membership, in part because I chopped 150 people off my membership rolls. People who were dead, people who I had not seen in three years, people who I had no clue and nobody knew who they were. So we took our membership from 550 down to three, uh, 500 down to 350. At the same time, our ASA, our average Sunday attendance, that has increased 12% a year every year for the last three years. We've doubled in seven years. And I think this year we're going to grow another 10%. Now, that having been said, there are places in my, I can speak with some knowledge about my diocese. In 10 years, Central Florida has lost 25% of its people. Why is that? Well, in my deanery, we had three churches go over to the ACNA. One in Ocala, which had 1,000 people, 800 went to the ACNA. My church went to the ACNA and the church in Mount Dora. The ACNA plant out of my church collapsed. It, it's gone. The this ACNA, is where you used to live over by Vero Beach. No, this is here. Oh, this, oh I'm sorry, I didn't know that. Okay. My, my, my individual church uh, had a schism and went down to about 30 people and about 100 went off to the ACNA. ACNA church fell apart after about a year or two. Mm -hmm. And 
the other church. Well, the long and the short is we've had two types of losses. We've had secessions to the ACNA, and then we've had uh, natural attrition. People die in Florida faster, it seems, than a lot of other places. Now, what's happened is in the past, you didn't have to worry about that in a Florida church because you always had people moving in. And if you went to an Episcopal church in New York State, you'd go to one in Florida. That was true a generation ago, but no longer. The, there are many, many churches in my diocese that are thriving, growing each year, and it's because they're not denominationally uh, focused. They're focused on bringing the good news to Jesus Christ. They're focused on all the things that these liberal seminaries don't teach, evangelism, outreach, social ministry, bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to people, such that when I have, uh, we brought in, uh, we welcomed three new couples yes, last weekend. Uh, two of them came from vineyard churches, and the others were Roman Catholics. Um, we're not getting Episcopalians moving from point A to point B. We're getting people who shop around and say, this is a place where God has preached. That is not universal no, by any means. No, it's not. But I, looking at the numbers, it was not just liberal dioceses that declined. You look at a place Albany like Albany. Declined. Albany declined as well. Albany is declining. Dallas is declining. Mm -hmm. um, Central Florida is declining. Uh, because, but you, the church in McKinney, Texas, and the Diocese of Dallas, for instance, has, I think, quadrupled in mm -hmm. seven or eight years. The new suburb, dynamic rector, there are you can point to places. And to be fair, there are some niche churches in the Episcopal Church who are basically gay churches that have done very well because they only focus on one little segment. Sure. What has been dying is the churches like mine that are the only Episcopal Church in town have to serve a broad coalition of people from the local doctor to the local truck driver. Those churches are in free fall and it's only and very few of them have been able to pull out we're lucky i don't know quite why um maybe it's the walking around money i give to people no, no. i bribe their children you're a very dynamic preacher george you you are clearly doing your calling i watched the video you you're you're a joy to watch um let's see uh, if i if i were uh, let me just push sure. this forward because i actually know some i was on what was called the 2020 commission Back in the year 2000, the Episcopal Church General Convention set up a committee to double the church by the year 2020. I was one of the people appointed to that National Church Standing Committee. I think I'm the only one whose church has doubled <laughs> in that 20-year period. And I, you know, I read all the things, I follow all the examples. And it's a combination, as you say, of preaching, of teaching, and of fellowship. That, what, that you walk in, you know that God loves you, that we love you and uh, God loves me as well. In other words, the ACNA churches in our part of the world have not thrived. One of the reasons is that some of them still exist because they're the anti-Episcopal church. And frankly, that doesn't appeal to somebody who's not already predisposed to being mad at the Episcopal church. Mm -hmm. Now, that will always have a demographic of people pissed off. But those ACNA churches that have done well are, if you will, the second wave, uh, who have basically, I don't care about the Episcopal Church, and are there building the gospel, building communities. They're doing just fine. But in the Episcopal Church and in the ACNA and in the continuing church, the old ways of doing things haven't, aren't working. Yeah, I can concur with that because uh, Jill and I had to move to another church because we moved to a new town. It was too hard to keep driving back to the other church. The church we go to now uh, in Fairfield, Connecticut, is not full of ex-Episcopalians or people who hate tech. Um, it, it's a completely different dynamic. The people who just joined the church when we joined the church um, are from different denominations. And uh, uh, if they had left tech, it's not because... Uh, they hated tech. It's because they moved to Fairfield, and this was a, a great church to go to. It's exactly how we work. Mm -hmm. And in other words, we ha we're we're different uh, different unions, but we have the same approach to membership recruitment. It's the ones, as you say, Kevin, that are stuck in this old model of, you know, that are are dying. Mm -hmm. And we just look at the national church statistics, and eventually, all those little old ladies are going to be dead. Yeah, I mean, if you looked at the average age, it's still going up. Um, all right, we talked about 
liking us on Facebook and YouTube. We talked about the tech crash. We talked about Welby. We talked about the primates meeting, 16 of 39. We didn't talk about Bruno. Oh, John Bruno. Bruno. Yes. <laughs> now, this may be a reason why the Episcopal Church is declining in the Los Angeles area. Yeah, it I, could I, be. I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to step out on a limb to say that having a corrupt bishop will not be good PR. Uh, Catherine Wainick, the president of the uh, appeals board, hearing Bishop Bruno's appeal, has re Now, when you appeal a decision, when you appeal it, it automatically stays the, the decision, which was that he not exercise his ministry, not have any authority. So even though he was found guilty, even though the sentence was pronounced, once he filed that appeal... That he could do what he wanted. Just, he could do what he wanted. Yep. Catherine Wainick as president of the board, has reinstituted this appeal, this suspension, slapping down John Bruno. He may not exercise the ministry and the authority of his office. Now, the problem is it begins January 1st. So John Bruno's got a 90-day window to destroy more parishes. Oh, jeez. You know, alienate more people. What's so, that you know, saying? If you give the, the devil an inch, he'll take a, a foot? A yard. Yeah, a yard. Whatever, I mean, but, <sighs> but the, uh, well, now, what is the importance of this? Well, this telegraphs quite clearly that uh, Bruno's uh, appeal has no merit, that they've looked at his initial uh, cause for appeal. They're going to wait for the legal arguments, but, man, he's not raised any issue that causes them to say, whoa, an injustice was made here. Rather the opposite. Whoa, we have to prevent an injustice and slap down John Bruno as quickly as we can. Okay. We do need to end the program because uh, my family is coming back from watching a movie uh, and uh, we have to uh, hit the road by 1.30. Uh, quickly next week, I have an uh, unscripted coming up with uh, our good friend Alan Haley talking about some of the more legal stuff coming out of Diocese of South Carolina. I've scored an interview with Bishop Chandler Jones of the APA, and he's going to talk a little bit about uh, their joint synod coming up. Uh, that will be an Anglican Voices episode. And I also scored an interview with the canon to the ordinary in the Diocese of South Carolina, Jim Lewis, and uh, he's got some interesting things to say that you guys will like very much. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. You've been watching episode 325. <laughs>